it's time for another amazing chemistry video with Mr. Stapleton. Proudly sponsored by Farming Doing Nice Coffee. Hi guys, welcome to this next video. This one's going to be all about primary bonds. Um, and this is normally something that gets covered in year 11. Um, so this is going to be a quick recap. Okay, um, I'm going to be explaining just the three different types of primary bonds and what impact that has upon their structure and some of their physical properties. So, first thing we're going to be talking about is the first type of primary bond. Okay, and I'm going to look at metallic bonds. Okay, so metallic bonds are those that occur between a metal and a metal atom. So two metal atoms combining together. <clears throat> now these combine, uh, obviously metal atoms, what metals want to do is they want to donate electrons. So they can't really donate electrons to each other. So what they do instead is they start forming this sort of structure. All right? And what we've got here, each of the pluses here, is a positive metal cation. So that's an atom, a metal atom that's lost an electron. Now what happens is that that electron actually goes between each of the metal atoms to form this what we call C of delocalized electrons, or sometimes you hear it referred to as a, a C, free C of valence electrons. Now that's really, really important for the structure for, um, for one real big main reason, okay? And that is that it allows metals to be really good conductors of, of electricity, okay? Now the reason for that is that these electrons are free. So if you put an electric charge at one end, okay, what it will do is these electrons will be able to pick that charge up and transfer it all the way to the other end. So they conduct electricity really well. The other thing that they do is they also conduct heat. Now, that comes about from the fact that you've got these atoms, all, right, all these metal atoms here, packed together really, really closely. Because they, they squish in, they've come nice and close together, they've got these electrons which hold them together with electrostatic attraction, okay? And um, what happens is that you get this big three-dimensional structure forming, okay? Now what happens when you supply heat to one end of the metal or part of the metal, you cause the atoms there to start vibrating because you're supplying energy. As that starts to vibrate, because the other atoms are so close, that starts to pick up some energy and start to vibrate as well. That makes the next one vibrate and the next one vibrate and it conducts the heat all the way down the metal. So metals are really good conductors of heat as well. So conducting electricity and heat all comes about from the fact that you have this big three-dimensional structure with this free C of valence electrons in the middle. Now because you've got so many atoms all packed in together, lots and lots of them together, and they're held together by this electrostatic attraction between the cation and the electrons, you have a very, very high melting point because you have to supply a lot of energy to break these bonds apart, to break apart these metal cations. Okay? So that's why metals have a really, really high melting point. Second one I'm going to be looking at is ionic bonding. Okay? So with ionic bonding, if I just swap them over, with ionic bonding, this time what we've got a metal and a non-metal. Okay, so we've got a non-metal plus a metal atom. So this occurs now via the exchange of valence electrons. So those outer shell electrons, the metal wants to lose it. So the metal atom loses an electron to, um, in order to get a stable outer shell, which it's got underneath. And the non-metal atom picks up the electron or electrons to get a full outer shell so it's stable as well. Okay? So this exchange of valence electrons makes a very, very strong ionic bond. Now what happens there is that this keeps happening over and over and over. And so what we do is we get a really, really big three-dimensional structure. Okay? So this is an example of salt, sodium chloride. Okay? And when we write sodium chloride, we write the formula NaCl. But as you can see by looking here at the diagram, we've actually got a big three-dimensional cube, it looks like. But what we've got here is every sodium, which is purple here, has one chlorine here. Sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, and we've got all the way through. So the ratio is one to one, which is why the formula we write is NaCl. Okay? This again is a big three-dimensional structure. We call this a crystal lattice. Okay? So this crystal lattice is a big three-dimensional structure. Okay? Has lots of really strong ionic bonds which come about from the exchange of valence electrons. So it requires a lot of energy to be able to break these bonds apart. Okay? So again, it has a high melting point. However, this time there's no free electrons because all the electrons are bound up within these bonds. And so metals, uh, sorry, ionic substances in their solid state don't conduct electricity. 
However, if you were to melt this, so you supply enough energy to break these bonds apart, what you now form is sodium ions and chlorine ions. And now you've got charged ions, you can conduct electrical current. So in the molten state, okay, when they're molten, they conduct electricity. Okay? But in the solid state they don't, because there's no free electrons. Okay? Alright. Final one I'm going to be looking at is covalent bonding. Alright, so we've looked at metallic bonding, which is between a metal and a metal. We've looked at ionic bonding, which is between a metal and a non-metal. And hopefully you can work out that our covalent bonding okay, is going to be between a non-metal and another non-metal. Now, this is different at this time from what we had before. All right? What happens is that these non-metals get, um, get together and they share their valence electrons. So what happens is the two atoms come close together. The um, valence shell electrons, or the valence shell orbitals, I should say, overlap each other so that they share their valence electrons in order to get a full outer shell, complete their octet. And that's important because sharing electrons isn't as strong as that full exchange of electrons. So covalent bonds are the weakest of the primary bonds. Okay? And that has an impact on a couple of other things as well. So when we're talking about covalent substances, normally we refer to molecules. Okay? So whereas before we had the big three-dimensional structures with metallic and ionic bonding, this time we normally get molecules. Okay? So what we've got here, I'm going to show a couple, is for example carbon dioxide, CO2. So we've got a carbon and two oxygens, okay? That just exists by itself. It's not a big three-dimensional structure, we've just got those by itself, okay? We've got hydrogen peroxide, a hydrogen, two oxygens, and another hydrogen, okay? We've got carbon monoxide, all right? We've got ethylene, we've got water, we've got oxygen, we've got ozone. All of these are examples of molecules. Um, they can bond to other um, molecules. So you can have, like, if you've got a, um, a jar with oxygen in it, you've got millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of oxygen molecules in there, but they're all floating around and they kind of interact with each other very weakly by something called um, secondary bonds. Now, secondary bonds I'll talk about in a completely different video, but what you need to look at is that these are not big three dimensional structures. And so all of these right, have very, very low boiling points and melting points because they uh, don't have a lot of bonds, so they don't have a lot of energy required to break them apart. Okay? So carbon dioxide, oxygen, ozone, carbon monoxide, ethylene, all of those exist as gases at room temperature, and water and hydrogen peroxide are liquids, but they have low boiling points so, um, because they don't have a lot of bonds holding them together. All right? What I'm going to just sidestep a little bit for us to talk about the two different types of bonds you can have. And what I'm just going to do is separate out the rest of these and I'm just going to keep carbon monoxide and oxygen over here. So over here in carbon monoxide we have a carbon and an oxygen which are bonded to each other. Okay? These are two different non-metal atoms. So because they're two different non-metal atoms, these are held together by what's called a polar covalent bond. All right. That means that the bond has a net direction of charge. But oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon, so in that bond the oxygen actually pulls more of the electron density towards itself. So it looks a little bit like this, it's a double bond between them, like this. All right. This oxygen has a negative charge, the carbon has a positive charge, and so the electrons are more drawn towards that, and there's a net direction of charge across the bond. So that's what we call a polar covalent bond. Here though, in oxygen, in the oxygen molecule, you've got two oxygen atoms. Okay? They are held together by a non-polar covalent bond. What that means is that the oxygen atoms share the electrons evenly, there's no charge on the oxygen atoms as such, no partial positive or negative charges, so there's no net direction of charge, so it's a non-polar covalent bond. It's important to note you can have both polar and non-polar covalent bonds existing in the same molecule. So if I grab back, um, actually I'll draw it for you, if I do hydrogen peroxide like this, all right, there's our molecule. All right, here we have a polar covalent bond because we have two different non-metal atoms. Okay? 
the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, draws more of the electron density to itself. But here, between the two oxygen atoms, we have a non-polar covalent bond. Because these two oxygens will share the electron density equally. So you can have both polar and non-polar bonds within a particular molecule. Alright? So, while covalent bonds, uh, sorry, covalent um, substances normally exist as molecules, you can occasionally have a couple of them that exist similar to ionic and metallic substances as big three-dimensional structures. First one I'm going to show you is this one. Now this is graphite. Okay. Graphite is simply carbon. Okay. But what you'll notice is that you've got these six-membered ring structures and you've got lots of them together. You've got more underneath and more underneath. Now I know these are different colours, but these are all carbon atoms. So what you've got is one sheet of, of carbon atoms, another sheet of carbon atoms, another sheet of carbon atoms, and so on and so on as you stack them up. Okay? Now that's important because between um, these carbon sheets are electrons, similar to what you found in the metallic substances. So that means that graphite can actually conduct electricity. Most covalent substances can't because there's no free electrons. Okay? But graphite has free electrons between the sheets, so it does conduct. Okay? The other important thing is because there are so many bonds there, okay, it has a really high melting point. So this conducts, okay, and it's got a high melting point. Both of those are completely opposite to what you normally find for covalent molecules. Think about um, oxygen gas, for example, gas at room temperature, very low melting point and boiling point, it doesn't conduct electricity. So graphite's a bit unique in that. The other one that's a very, very similar with a big three-dimensional structure is silicon dioxide. Okay? Now, silicon dioxide has a form of SiO2. The silicons are the blues, the oxygen is golds. So if you have a look through, you'll notice that there's a lot of blue and a lot of gold. So it's this big three-dimensional structure. So again, what we've got is lots of bonds to be broken, so a really high melting point. Okay? Now the reason it's SiO2 is because I'm drawing in here, you can see these little red kidney bean shapes that I've done here. If you actually draw it through, you'll notice that for every one blue silicon, you've got two gold oxygens. So the ratio is 1 to 2, which is why it's SiO2. Now if you don't know the common name of SiO2, it's sand. Right? Silicon dioxide is sand. Okay? has a very, very high melting point. However, no, no free electrons through here, so it doesn't conduct which is a really good thing, because you don't really want to be down the beach, standing on the beach, all right, and have it conduct electricity, okay? So, what I encourage you to do is go back and have a look at the three different types of bondings. We've looked at metallic bonding between metal and metal, okay? We've looked at ionic bonding between non-metal and metal, and we've got covalent bonding between two non-metals. I suggest you have a look at them, you make sure you understand about the different types of bonding, what effect it has upon the structure, and also upon um, its melting point, boiling point, and its conductivity. Hope this has helped. If you need any um, further questions you want to ask me, just come and see me. Thanks, guys. See ya.